Hello you knaves, welcome to Shakespeare Academy. I was looking at the analytics for this channel and I noticed that most of you are not subscribed. What would Shakespeare do in this situation? When, in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state. Those are the first two lines of Shakespeare's Sonnet 29. We don't know why the speaker is troubled. Around this time in Shakespeare's life, in the early 1590s, the theatres were closed because of an outbreak of the plague. Shakespeare probably worked on his sonnets and his poems during this period, and maybe Sonnet 29 reflects the feelings of someone who is unable to earn a living at the theatre. Or you can take the approach that Don Patterson takes in his commentary reading Shakespeare's sonnets. You're sad? Join the club. The argument of this poem is simple. When I feel awful, I think of you, then I feel better. <laughs> you serious? Yep. That's it. The first eight lines, the octave, describe how the speaker feels lonely and sad. He's had some bad luck, no one likes him, not even God is listening to his prayers. The speaker is an outcast and in disgrace not only horizontally in the social world, but also vertically in the world of fortune and heaven. Hey, me, Lord. Where have I gone wrong? I've always been nice to people. I don't drink or dance or swear. The word bootless means useless and comes from an old meaning of the word boot, as we can see from an entry in the Best English Dictionary from the Second Best English University. The third line of the sonnet also has irregular scansion. Scansion refers to the arrangement of stressed and unstressed syllables in a line of poetry. The first two lines of the poem are regular, with alternating stressed and unstressed syllables. But as I said, the third line is irregular. As you can see here, the words deaf and heaven which were both pronounced with one syllable back in Shakespeare's day, are jarringly shoved together, emphasizing the feeling of discomfort. In line six, featured means beautiful, and the repetition at the end of one clause and the start of the next clause, known as anadiplosis, locks the speaker in his desire to be like other men. Helen Venler argues that the first eight lines describe two hierarchies, one of the social world and one of the natural world. The speaker in his outcast state is at the bottom of the social hierarchy, below other men, kings, fortune, and heaven. Somewhere between line nine and 10 though, we get the Volta, a sudden change in mood or thought. The fulcrum is the word aptly, which means by chance or even fortunately. The speaker here realizes in fact he is not entirely destitute. He does have something he enjoys, the thought of his beloved. The speaker's mood improves as he moves from the social hierarchy into the natural hierarchy. After the volta, the speaker has the sullen earth beneath him and is moving up through the lark to his beloved and then finally to heaven, which was previously deaf to his prayers and his cries. By the time we get to the couplet, the speaker has combined the two hierarchies and his newly elevated state sings hymns at heaven's gate. The present participles from the octave, wishing and desiring, have become the more optimistic arising, which chimes with the brings, sing and kings we see in the last four lines of the poem, creating a much more joyous mood. The enjambment with the word arising in line 11 is the only one we have in the poem, which up to that point had felt rather restricted like the speaker's feelings. But the mention of the sullen earth in the next line is rather pathetic. Don Patterson calls it a sentimental and poor metaphor because instead of coming up with an interesting image to express his feelings, the speaker has taken one off the shelf and imbued it with his own emotion. The sullen earth isn't sullen to the lark, which would be fine. It's sullen to the speaker, which is not. This is known as pathetic fallacy or a transferred epithet or a pallage and generally Generally, it's bad form. You shouldn't mess with the literal meaning of something just to make it fit your metaphor. Addison puts it this way. If you interfere with the internal consistency of the vehicle and start altering it to fit your metaphor better, the whole trope falls apart and has no power, unless you're a sentimentalist. That's gotta hurt! We have other patterns in this poem too. Shakespeare uses the word state three times in this poem, each time with a slightly different meaning, although of course meanings can and do overlap. The first state in line two refers to the speaker's condition, all alone and outcast. The second state in line 10 refers to his mindset, his improved mood, his joyous feeling, the third state in the last line refers to a kingdom and to the pomp and the ceremony associated with it. But I think with this last state, we also have a hint of the second meaning as well. 
The speaker has returned to his prosperous, integrated and original position. The one he had before he fell into disgrace. That's all for today. If there are any other sonnets you want me to talk about, please let me know in the comments. And don't forget to liketh and subscribeth.